just like to welcome you to our first attempt at doing a webinar. Um, we kindly supported by ALNAP to provide us with technical assistance. I will ask Naz to start the presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much Lisa. Lisa. Um, it's, it's great, great to be here, here and uh, uh, really thankful for the opportunity to be able to be the inaugural uh, guinea pig on the webinar for EISF and also um, to discuss this topic of uh, counterterrorism and the impact of counterterrorism measures on humanitarian um, action. In particular, I want to really emphasize that I think our discussion um, should try to find the areas where this topic is relevant to security focal points and security actors within humanitarian organizations. Um, overall, of course, I think this topic is relevant to those working on issues of security, but I think there are also some areas where um, we can kind of hone in on the salient points for security focal points. So um, for the discussion today, I'd like to uh, focus on a few points. First, I'm just going to talk about the relationship between counterterrorism laws and counterterrorism policies and uh, policies and principles underlying humanitarian action. I know some of you are familiar with this topic and have heard presentations on this before, but because it can be quite a complicated arena, um, I do want to make sure we cover just the basic core tension. Um, I think it's always useful to kind of remind ourselves about sort of where, why are we talking about these two areas of law and policy that often seem quite distinct from one another. Um, and then I'll get into kind of a few of what we see as the pressing topics at hand today. Uh, Counterterrorism clauses in humanitarian grant agreements, partner vetting systems and other vetting systems that may pose unique security risks in environments where listed armed groups control territory, um, and finally, the particular challenge of medical care in armed conflict, where that medical care is provided to individuals who are members of prohibited or listed groups. Um, let me say a word about myself and my project for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, my name is Naz Modirzadeh. I'm a senior fellow at the Counterterrorism and Humanitarian Engagement Project at Harvard Law School. We are a uh, Swiss-funded um, research and policy program that focuses on the relationship between international law, international humanitarian law, uh, put particularly that focus on humanitarian assistance and humanitarian access, and the relationship of that set of laws to counterterrorism laws and policies, either at the international level, put forward by the Security Council and um, General Assembly, or at the domestic level in terms of criminal material support laws and other laws prohibiting support to terrorism. Uh, we work with a number of UN agencies, humanitarian INGOs, and governments um, in trying to identify operational and legal dilemmas that come out of this intersection. Um, and some of the research I'm going to be talking about today is from a uh, Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs funded research project um, supported by NRC that looks specifically at counterterrorism based clauses in grant agreements and the measures taken by humanitarian organizations to comply with those clauses. I'm happy to talk about that at greater length um, if it's of interest to some of you. So let me get into the presentation now. And so we're looking at a slide called Two Countervailing Trajectories. This is sort of the overarching way that I find it useful to think about this issue, uh, and, and hopefully you will as well. Um, and, and the way I, I sort of think about this, and I, if you were looking at me, I'm sort of crossing my, my hands in an X, is that you had two sets of norms and two sets of policies often very operational, that for many years were developing independent of one another. So on the one hand, and this is certainly the one that uh, we tend to hear about much more in the humanitarian uh, framework, is international humanitarian law, domestic uh, law and norms, 
and humanitarian policies that support uh, humanitarian access and an expanding understanding of what humanitarian access means. So we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years that the Security Council and that many do donor governments have seemed to want to go beyond humanitarian law in terms of their uh, support for a much broader understanding of humanitarian access and assistance. And central to this development is a sense that in the contemporary age, any form of meaningful humanitarian assistance in an armed conflict involves engagement with all parties to the armed conflict, including non-state armed groups. And more and more we've seen in Security Council resolutions, General Assembly resolutions, good humanitarian donorship, all kinds of donor government statements that access is framed very broadly and is framed as encouraging humanitarian actors to um, interact with, negotiate with all parties to armed conflict in order to reach beneficiaries in the civilian population. The other trajectory and the one I'll be spending a bit more time on today is one that for many years, I think humanitarian actors were not familiar with at all um, and had very little reason to be familiar with, and that is the set of laws and government policies that seek to prohibit benefits reaching terrorist organizations. Um, I'm not going to spend any time talking about who is a terrorist. Uh, for our purposes, uh, the definition really is a very... Uh, simple and formalistic one. A terrorist is whomever governments or the Security Council says are terrorists. Um, and the reason that I don't spend a lot of time on this issue is if you are an organization that receives government funding, whether you believe that terrorist lists are political or biased or um, privilege some groups over others, may or may not be true as a matter of fact or political science or history, but it matters very, very little uh, in terms of your legal obligation. And what I mean by that is if you get money from a donor and that donor says that a particular group is a terrorist group and they further say that you have obligations vis-a-vis -vis groups listed as terrorist groups at the risk of being uh, blunt, that is what matters to your organization in terms of ensuring uh, both its compliance with its legal obligations and, in many cases, uh, its operational and sort of practical security. So in many presentations I've given, someone will say, but you know, what about the problem that today's terrorist is tomorrow's freedom fighter? What about the fact that these are very political determinations? And Sure, yes, of course, that has to be right. I would encourage us to not become overly caught up in that aspect of the question. For purposes of our discussion, um, terrorist is what governments and the Security Council say it is. And we may not find that to be a particularly satisfying definition, but um, legally speaking and in terms of the obligations, that really is what matters um, as we have been looking at uh, grant agreements and um, UN uh, grants as well. So let me get into some of the substance here. Um, I'm going to uh, focus in on a few areas of the law and then we'll move into some of the more practical implications. Um, but I want to give you a sense of, sort of the legal environment in which the practical implications are being found and the strength of the law that is affecting humanitarian operations. The sense that governments appear to have that right now, at least, counterterrorism laws and counterterrorism policies are a real priority in terms of um, regulating financial flows operational decisions and funding for humanitarian aid and development aid. So 
I look at Security Council, and then I'm going to use the U.S. as an example, but uh, as many of you are aware, uh, we've seen a increase in counterterrorism, criminal, and other laws in a number of countries. Uh, certainly, the U.K. and Canada are, appear to be closest to the U.S. in terms of the rigorousness of their laws and their appetite for uh, ensuring that those laws are passed down to, to grantees that receive government funding. Uh, but we've also seen these laws developing in other states, and there is now a good deal of research going on on host state regulation. So uh, governments that have uh, humanitarian crises on their territories and are um, the recipients of not just a considerable amount of funding, but also humanitarian operations, um, we've also seen a marked increase in those governments uh, developing domestic counterterrorism regimes. So I'll just take uh, a little bit of time to talk about sort of the, the legal environment and then we'll move to, as I said, some of the more practical implications. Um, at the Security Council level, the most important two resolutions for our purposes are 1267 and 1373. 1373 is a resolution that essentially tells every UN member state under Chapter 7 authority, so under the most powerful lawmaking authority of the Security Council, that they must have domestic counterterrorism laws that limit um, the flow of resources to terrorist organizations and seek to name certain groups as terrorist groups. So some have argued that this was a effort by the United States to essentially globalize its counterterrorism laws and regulations. Whether one agrees with that or not, the important aspect of this resolution is to understand every government on the planet is required to implement counterterrorism laws in its domestic legal regime. They may differ as to how they do that, they may differ as to the scope um, of their regulations, but this is now a global issue and it is a global legal regime that is being actively pursued by uh, the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate and the Counterterrorism Committee, so the Security Council mandated bodies that are uh, monitoring this Chapter 7 resolution and ensuring that states are complying. There's a researcher who works on these issues who has said that if human rights resolutions were monitored with the vigorousness of uh, 1373, we would be living in a very different world and and the sense there is the Security Council has taken this incredibly seriously. So the Security Council visits states in order to ensure that they are implementing uh, domestic regulations and mechanisms to to respect 1373 and the Council demands that states regularly provide reports on how they are implementing 1373's requirements domestically. So again, a really um, fast-moving resolution and one that since to its creation in 2001, uh, some 25 or so days after the attacks of September the 11th, 2001, uh, we have seen an incredible growth of domestic counterterrorism laws based on 1373. 1267, and there are a series of sort of children of 1267, but 1267 is a dynamic Security Council maintained list of organizations and individuals that are named as being affiliated to or part of Al-Qaeda. Uh, 1267 was initially an Al-Qaeda and Taliban list. The Taliban list has since been broken out, uh, but 1267 is on a weekly basis changed. So it can be added to and individuals and entities can be removed from the 1267 list. Uh, but the importance of this list is, again, Chapter 7 authority 
every UN member state has to ensure that anyone on the 1267 list has a travel ban imposed on them so they cannot um, travel uh, internationally and in many cases internally within the boundaries of a state and an asset freeze. So their bank accounts, their access to resources must be cut off by the state. Uh, just to give you a very recent example, you may have seen some eight days ago or so now, uh, the Security Council added the Nigerian group, uh, often called uh, Boko Haram, a, a shortening um, or a slang version of their title, armed group in Nigeria, um, to the 1267 list as an Al-Qaeda affiliate. So we'll get into this, but this has immediate practical implications for humanitarian organizations and certainly has immediate practical implications for governments, your donors and where you are working. Every government that day had to do something about the fact that Boko Haram had been added to the list. Uh, I should note there is now a mechanism by which individuals can be removed from this list uh, with an attempt, I think, by the Security Council to provide uh, additional due process and respect for human rights of individuals who may have been wrongly added to the list. Um, but for most of the groups we care about, that does not appear to be the issue. Second, in terms of domestic uh, regimes. So this can be either states that are seeing their obligations under the Security Council resolution and saying, okay, now we're going to create our own domestic counterterrorism system modeled on 1373. So this is what you often see in European uh, states is that they are looking at their Security Council obligations and they are creating a domestic counterterrorism regime largely modeled on that. Or you can have states that go far beyond the Security Council's requirements, and the United States is an excellent example of that. I'll just say very briefly a few things about the U.S. law. I can talk in question and answer about sort of how this differs from other systems, but I really, really, I think it's important, even if your organization does not receive U.S. funding, even if you are not a U.S. citizen and you have no U.S. citizens in your organization, and even if you never plan to travel to the United States, even if you satisfy all three of those uh, criteria, it's critical to understand U.S. counterterrorism law because the United States government is actively seeking to influence the counterterrorism laws of other states. Um, and the logic for this is, I, I don't mean to suggest it's a nefarious uh, goal, the logic is that uh, one of the main findings of um, the reports that sought to understand uh, the rise of, of Al-Qaeda and the September 11th attacks, one of the main findings was that Al-Qaeda was able to take advantage of global transnational financial networks in order to enrich itself and to uh, create the capacity to engage in uh, attacks around the world. So if you are trying to stop Al-Qaeda and its affiliates, one of the most important aspects is to reach into the financial systems of other countries, particularly countries that may have weaker governance systems, and transform their laws, their regulations, and their enforcement capacity. So there's a logic to this, but it's important for us to understand U.S. counterterrorism law is the model that is being used in shaping the counterterrorism laws, regulations, and enforcement approaches of many, many states that today have humanitarian operations occurring on their territory. So this is Australia's listed terrorist organizations. So this is Australia saying... We have an obligation under Security Council Resolution 1373 to have a domestic counterterrorism legal system, and we've been encouraged to create a domestic list. So some countries will say our list merely mirrors the Security Council's list. That is a 
uh, I would say, a diminishing number of countries. Most countries want to have their own domestic list, which may reflect um, threats to their nation in particular. There may be organizations that really have identified one country as the primary target of their terrorist activities, or it may reflect uh, domestic political sensibilities that could be different from others. One good example of that is uh, the United States has long held that Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. Uh, the UK, Australia, Canada, and now the EU may consider Hezbollah's armed branch as a terrorist organization, and many other countries don't consider Hezbollah to be a terrorist organization. So that's something where countries may have different approaches. So this is Australia. This is Canada. Um, so you'll see this is a longer list. Um, and we have groups here that were not on um, Australia's list. And again, if you are receiving Canadian funding or if you're an organization that's either based in Canada or has branches in Canada, it would be important to look at this list and remember that these lists change. So Canada uh, recently added the Taliban to their list. Uh, and um, Hamas was added not so long ago either. So you may see this changing. I do want to point out here, by the way, you could have countries listing state entities in their terrorist list. So if you look at this list in the middle, you have the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force. That is a branch of the Iranian government that is listed in the terrorist list. So again, States can be quite peculiar as to how they do this, and it does differ from, from state to state. Uh, U.S. foreign terrorist organization list, again, even longer than the Canadian list. Um, and uh, as you'll see, it has a number of Al-Qaeda branches broken out. This was changed some about a week ago. Um, and it's, it, we are seeing this more and more as we observe these uh, trends. The United States announced that it was listing separately the Nusra Front or Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria and the uh, Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant or the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, ISIS or ISIL, in recognition of the fact that those groups had now broken from one another. So again, states are really paying attention and they're making these lists very responsive to facts on the ground. United Kingdom is the next one, and we'll see how this all comes together in a moment. Keep in mind that these lists all are tied to different domestic legal regime, right? So in the United States, the terrorist list is the basis for the statute prohibiting material support to terrorism. So the U.S. statute will say material support to foreign terrorist organizations, and that's telling you you need to look at the U.S. foreign terrorist organization list. In the United Kingdom, the Terrorism Act will make reference to the prescribed terrorist organizations list and will tell you these acts that are prohibited are prohibited vis-a-vis -vis the groups that we have listed here. Again, if we look at the U.K. list, you have a number of Irish-related groups that, of course, are not going to be found on the Spanish terrorist list, right? At the end, you'll see the Ulster Defense Organization, the Ulster Freedom Fighters. And again, this is going to change over time. There are going to be some organizations that will uh, come on and some that will um, be taken off. Now, I'm going to not spend a lot of time on the next few slides, but I just want, I do want to emphasize that as we all know and as we've all had many uh, trainings and seminars and sessions within our own organizations, humanitarian access and as I noted earlier, in particular engagement with uh, all parties to an armed conflict and non-state armed groups is supported by a whole series of laws and policies. And these are the laws and policies we tend to emphasize in humanitarian organizations. We tend to emphasize IHL. We tend to emphasize the Red Cross Code of Conduct. We tend to emphasize good humanitarian donorship, as, of course, makes sense. 
these are the laws and policies, after all, that underscore our work. And I don't in any way want to suggest that that ought to change. I do, however, want to emphasize that those laws and policies that make up the real core of the humanitarian mandate, mission, imperative, are not operating alone on a planet somewhere where everything is humanitarian. They are operating in a complex legal environment and they can be affected by other laws and policies that seek to act on the space of armed conflict. Right. So if you imagine, let's take the occupied Palestinian territory and the conflict between uh, Israel and armed groups in the OPT. We have IHL applying there, right? We have international humanitarian law in the form of largely the Fourth Geneva Convention and occupation law with all kinds of provisions on humanitarian access and assistance. Very useful. We then have humanitarian policy of many uh, donor governments, uh, indeed uh, a, a whole series of humanitarian policies that have been uh, over the years developed and refined, particular to OPT. We have General Assembly resolutions. We have from the most general on humanitarian access to particular related to uh, this particular conflict. And we have all kinds of donor commitments to the CAP, to SPHERE, to all kinds of processes that have been developed in the humanitarian world. We also have a number of donor governments and states who have created counterterrorism laws and policies directly targeting Hamas as an organization and seeking to make illegal any kind of financial and in many cases uh, material benefit to Hamas. Hamas is acting as a governing authority in the Gaza Strip. Humanitarian actors are seeking access to that territory in order to benefit the civilian population in that territory. In that case, the legal environment in which you are operating is pretty complicated. And it may even at times be contradictory. It may even at times mean that one donor is very much emphasizing the counterterrorism goals and another donor is very much emphasizing humanitarian assistance and reaching the population. So this is an attempt to demonstrate what it looks like in a particular context to have all of these frameworks intersecting. So let me just explain this for a minute and then we're going to move to, I'm going to close with sort of some of the practical examples of, of what this looks like in the, in the real world. So in the middle, you have UN Security Council Resolution 1612. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. I'm not going to go into it in any detail. It's a Security Council resolution uh, that creates a monitoring and reporting mechanism, the goal of which is to uh, cease grave violations against children in armed conflict. And it seeks to do that through a number of mechanisms, uh, one of which is that it tells UNICEF and its partner organizations and, and other agencies of the United Nations to engage armed groups and state armed forces that are engaging in these grave violations against children in armed conflict to help them to stop committing those grave violations against children in armed conflict. This resolution has been hailed as one of the most uh, innovative and forward thinking in terms of protection of uh, civilians in armed conflict, certainly in the arena of protection of children in armed conflict, and contains within it a, a really quite powerful mechanism for monitoring and reporting. The Security Council creates a list of groups and entities that have been engaged in these violations, and I'm just going to go back to show you what that list looks like. So that's the list. This is the one from, I think, 2013. So yeah. It may have slightly changed, but, but probably not very much. And you'll see that the list will have both armies, state armed forces, and armed groups. So these are groups that have engaged in 
grave violations against children are. It's not saying we're creating a list in order to sanction and punish. While that remains a possibility, that's not their first sentiment. It is, we are listing you, and now we want to create a system that will create opportunities for you to stop engaging in those grave violations. And one of them is for uh, relevant uh, child protection actors to engage with listed entities in order to develop them to end these violations, and, and particularly on recruitment and use of children in armed conflict. When we overlap that 1612 list with the lists of United States, Australia, United Kingdom, and Canada, what we find is many of the groups are showing up on both the lists. So what does that mean? That means that the Security Council appears to be telling humanitarian organizations, UNICEF, partner bodies, go, we are mandating you to go out into the world and engage al-Shabaab in diminishing its use of children in armed conflict and ending grave violations against children in armed conflict, on the one hand. On the other hand, we are telling you that that is a prescribed group, and any benefit or material support to that group is either a criminal act or is prohibited through regulatory mechanisms. And depending on the donor, this is going to differ, right? So as you see, the United States is going to have a different number of organizations that overlap than another one. This is just one example, but it's meant to illustrate that it would appear that the there is a real tension here between a vision of protection, security, humanitarian assistance that sees humanitarian actors as engaging with all relevant parties in order to best and most meaningfully deliver assistance and protect uh, individuals caught up in armed conflict and laws and policies that seek to name and isolate certain groups as, and individuals as prohibited or prescribed, and in so doing, seek to criminalize those who would benefit these listed groups and organizations. So let's talk a little bit about practical implications. There are a few, and, and I know that we got some questions and comments in advance that I think touch on some of these issues that, that I'll be very briefly addressing. So the first possibility, perhaps the most promising possibility, is to say, okay, there's a tension here, sure, but it's not meant to be a tension. So the logic here is the states that put forward these counterterrorism laws and policies and the Security Council that promulgated resolutions like 1373 were not thinking about humanitarian assistance when they made these regulations. And that their primary target was banks, um, individuals using front or cover organizations in order to launder funds and get them to terrorists, and, and people who want to support terrorism, right? That's their main goal, not MSF, not IRC, not SAFE. In that model of thinking about this problem, the best, most effective way to solve the tension that I've just illustrated is to create exemptions. So for many of your organizations, the one very practical approach is to say, we see that we are working in, let's take Somalia. Right? So Al-Shabaab has been listed by the Security Council as a sanctioned organization, not as a terrorist organization, by the way, as a sanctioned organization. Um, the United States has listed Al-Shabaab as a terrorist organization. Organization. We see, we look at this slide set or some other resource, and we see that that creates all kinds of prohibitions for assistance to, a benefit to al-Shabaab. That's one fact, and, and we know that. 
Number two, we see, and there's so much evidence of this now, there was a time when saying this was a bit controversial. I, I don't think it's particularly controversial anymore to say that we know that organizations that were and and in some cases are active in South and Central Somalia in territory controlled by al-Shabaab found themselves being told you have to pay a tax, you have to pay a registration fee, you have to give us something if you wish to continue operating in the territory we control. So that's another fact. Right? So let's say for purposes of our discussion, a $500 registration fee. Not at the end of a gun, not you know uh, um, some coercion as such, but a clear quid pro quo. We need this registration fee if you want to be able to operate in the area that we control. And the third fact is we have millions of dollars from donors and urging from the Security Council to get humanitarian assistance to the population in Somalia, the worst hit areas being in areas controlled by al-Shabaab. One approach is the one you see here on your screen. It is an exemption, uh, that, a carve-out, it was often called, that was created in 2010 by the Security Council, a uh, particular to Somalia, that said that those organizations, it was UN observer status, <clears throat> excuse me, organizations, so UN agencies and programs, their partners, and then those with observer status like the ICRC, were exempted from the sanction that was being imposed by the Security Council for purposes of delivery of urgently needed humanitarian assistance. So one possible way to deal with this situation is to start pushing for more exemption. Essentially to tell the Security Council and governments, every time you create a sanction or a counterterrorism law, you have to put in that proviso that this is not meant to affect or regulate humanitarian action. And let me show you what this looks like in domestic law. This is the New Zealand um, exemption. This is this is incorporated into all counterterrorism law. Uh, the offense of providing support to a terrorist organization is drafted to exclude humanitarian assistance to a designated terrorist individual. Um, and let me show you what that uh, looks like in a potentially American context. This is the Humanitarian Assistance Facilitation Act, also called HAFA, which attempts to do a New Zealand style carve out to the law as such. Right? So this is a big, big topic of debate right now within our community. Is, is it a good idea to push for these kinds of exemptions? If they are successful, they would essentially reframe counterterrorism laws to recognize that humanitarian assistance has to be exempted. But I want to talk for a minute about vetting. So if I were to sort of list off kind of topics of, of hot debate in, our, in this area right now, one, one would be the exemptions, the drive for exemptions, the, the question of exemptions. Two is the issue of vetting. So uh, in my personal view, um, for security focal points and security actors in particular, this is where this issue is practically going to matter for you. And this is an issue that may not be brought to your attention. Um, our research looking at how organizations operate internally indicates that communication even within organizations is often very weak on this, on this issue for a variety of reasons. It's sensitive. It's hard to talk about. Many times we don't even know that there are counterterrorism regulations that may apply to our organizations. But let me say, and again, I, this is my personal view, uh, and I don't at all mean to suggest that everyone should agree with this, but my perspective is if, if we were going to draw out one aspect of this that has real, possibly immediate security implications, it would be vetting. So, Vetting overall is a requirement that you may often find in uh, grants, clauses, other agreements that your organization signs. And it is essentially a, a requirement that says, 
grantee, let's make up an NGO, right? So let's say Good Food NGO gets a contract and it says Good Food hereby agrees that in their operations in Somalia, they will vet all uh, staff, partner organizations, contractors, and vendors against the 1267 list and the Canadian uh, terrorist list. Let's say this is money coming from Canada. That's simple then. Right, so that, as you can imagine, already creates possibly some real questions for us to think about from a security perspective. Who in your staff is going to be tasked with doing this vetting? Will they tell the partners, vendors, and contractors that they are doing this? In a particular context like Somalia, is it safe to uh, inform partners and vendors that you are running the names of individuals against a Canadian or put the word Western in or put US in terrorist list? Um, do you need to have a plan for how to explain to those partners, vendors, and contractors what you're doing with the names that you're putting into the terrorist list? So I've heard more than once from NGOs that staff believe that the vetting software is owned by the Central Intelligence Agency and that the CIA is actually using vetting to collect names. And in the current climate, that may not be a completely uh, ludicrous uh, concern. More complex, you may have governments such as the United States that's going much farther than that vetting that I just described to require that grantees actually collect detailed personal information on key personnel within the organization, so your staff, and key personnel of partner and subcontracting organizations, so the local NGO that you work with in Syria or Turkey, and to give that information directly to the USAID not vetting yourself against the list, but rather sending all that information to USAID. Given what we know about, for example, uh, attacks on polio um, vaccine providers in Pakistan, in what was referred to by the groups that were carrying out these attacks as a direct retaliation for the involvement of medical of vaccination programs in the effort to like, find Osama bin Laden. What do you do with this requirement? And how do you think about this from a security perspective? And what does the conversation look like within your organization when this kind of requirement is imposed contractually? Finally, I, I do want to suggest, and I think I've talked um, enough about sort of the possibilities of, of legal um, requirements, but there's also, of course, reputational harm. And for many organizations, um, this may also be a security issue, right? There's the immediate security concern of what does it look like for us to go to the trucking company or the warehousing company and ask for this kind of detailed information. But there's also the concern about what if a interest group creates a website saying your organization is providing support to terrorists and is able to use applicable law in order to bolster that claim? We've seen this happen. World Vision Australia was accused by Shurat Hadin, the Israel Law Center, of providing material support to uh, a number of uh, prescribed Palestinian groups and a pretty impressive public relations campaign was carried out uh, across a number of countries ultimately leading to a formal investigation by the Australian Parliament into whether or not AusAid had uh, made mistakes in funding World Vision Australia. The findings of the investigation were not at all, that all groups had, had acted appropriately and that AusAid had, had monitored its funds appropriately. But 
this was at a significant cost to World Vision and its partners um, and delayed the provision of assistance for some six to nine months. Um, so the costs of this may well be more strongly felt on the practical side than on the legal side. It's, it's unlikely that humanitarian organizations at this time are going to be prosecuted in droves by the United States or the United Kingdom or Canada today. We haven't seen it. But it is perhaps much more likely that uh, either at the field level or at the headquarters level, organizations are going to find themselves coming under increasing scrutiny and having to think about this issue not just at the level of your lawyer or your head of HR, but also at the level of security um, and what it means to think about this issue from the perspective of security actors. I'm going to close there um, and uh, turn to questions. Hello, thanks very much, Naz. Um, question first that came in from Susan Mew of Cordaid. Um, Supporting transferring funds to partner organizations that provide humanitarian support and are active in countries that are on the US list of prescribed terrorist organizations may have been given um, an exemption uh, from the counterterrorism legislation because of the humanitarian mandate. However, where organizations are focused more on development or have a dual humanitarian development mandate, does this exemption still apply? or um, does it not apply? And, and how can organizations then best deal with this situation? Thank you very much, uh, Susan, Susan, and that, and that is, is a great question. One, one that I think we don't talk about enough. Uh, so the simple answer to your question, and I put up on the screen now, this is a, a real counterterrorism clause in a real grant agreement between USAID and an NGO uh, for humanitarian assistance. And uh, this is the requirement of the organization to essentially um, attest that it is not and has not provided support to terrorist organizations. Um, so the exemption that you you are referring to, I think, is usually called a license. So this is when a organization will go to the United States Treasury and say, we know that in Somalia, we're going to be asked for this tax, or we are going to be uh, operating in an area where we cannot assure with 100% certainty that there isn't going to be a benefit to illicit group. So we want a license from the United States government that says, for this period of time, in this particular place, you are authorized to do things which would otherwise be illegal, right? And it almost always, it's not, it's not that the license says it is only for humanitarian action as such, but it usually is limited to um, a particular area at a particular time and a very clearly laid out set of activities. Um, the problem with development work is, is twofold. One, it doesn't, I, humanitarian law does not provide the sort of protection for that activity as such. And two, development activity may be far more risky on the counterterrorism side. So think about um, Hamas. If, if you're doing state building activity, d development activity with Hamas, it's much more difficult to argue that that is kind of the type of humanitarian assistance that might be otherwise exempted from the law, right? So, um, indeed, I mean, much of what we're talking about in terms of these exemptions and licenses is for humanitarian work. It is not for development work. And dual-hatted, dual-mandated organizations uh, may want to really think about the risk exposure on different types of activities. Thanks very much, Naz. Um, and then a couple of questions from Nazik Avigan. I think that's how it's pronounced from Mission East. Um, one on the impact of counterterrorism legislation on civil military coordination, where humanitarian actors have to work in coordination with 
military forces present on the ground. And I think you were talking about this. Um, some of the lists uh, as, as how different military groups are incorporated. And another question on um, where the imperative of humanitarian need may be at conflict with the objectives and the implementation of counterterrorism laws, um, where certain groups may be of the population, of the beneficiary population, may be labelled as terrorists or prescribed groups. Yeah, thanks very much. Great questions. Um, on civil military, I would say in the immediate sense, there's probably not much of an impact. You have these rare instances where, um, so there are a number of countries where branches of the armed forces have been sanctioned or named in a variety of either domestic or security council laws, um, usually in it, as human rights abusers or other mechanisms, not counterterrorism. So I don't think this is a primary concern for civil military, however, I do think if you're operating in an area where uh, there are listed groups active and you are engaging in civil military coordination in that area, we have observed in our research that organizations are often getting very different messages from donor governments and those present on the ground. Um, so you may want to really be cautious about if your civil liaison is saying one thing about the applicable counterterrorism law and your donor rep on the ground is saying another thing and then you're hearing from capital yet another thing. Um, in my experience those may be very different accounts of what the counterterrorism law says and it just may be a good idea to, to ensure that you have some kind of independent check on what you're hearing from government representatives. Uh, second, and that goes for host state and donors by the way. Uh, your second question, uh, indeed I think that the humanitarian imperative can be in conflict with uh, counterterrorism I really like your use of the word implementation. I think it can often be at odds with some of the ways in which counterterrorism measures are implemented. Uh, some humanitarian actors have suggested that the goals of counterterrorism and humanitarianism may be well aligned insofar as they seek to protect individuals from attacks. Uh, and some have said that that's not an appropriate statement for humanitarian actors to make given that it would suggest somehow that humanitarians are um, participating in some kind of a political determination. I think regardless of where you end up on that question, there's no doubt that there is a tension here and in some cases a real conflict. And um, it can reach down to the beneficiary population. The best example, practically speaking, that I can think of for that is camp management and camp populations. So if you have a situation where your organization is working in a large uh, refugee or IDP camp environment and you know that listed groups are present, in some camps they may organize, they may come to you and say, we are here as the group, we're named, we know who we are. Um, what do you do as a uh, organization in terms of thinking through aid distribution and uh, provision of assistance? And so far, our sense is that donors are sensitive to this problem and they understand that there really is a dilemma posed if these laws are seen as going down to the beneficiary level. Uh, so for example, US uh, law, says that it is not meant to go down to the beneficiary level in terms of the requirement to vet uh, individuals, but it's a very gray area. Uh, and certainly uh, in some contexts, organizations have found themselves walking a very uncomfortable line between donors demanding assurances and humanitarian organizations being deeply concerned that it would be a violation of humanitarian principles for them to seek to obtain detailed information on their beneficiaries.
Nazan, yes. another question um, from me this time. This is Ruth speaking. Um, there is a perception that Muslim affiliated organisations are specifically targeted by the legislation. Um, have you found that this rings true? First of all, absolutely, that's the perception. Um, global. I mean, in, in our experience around the world, that is the perception. I think. There are a few practical areas where we're going to see this being important. One, there's a considerable amount of anecdotal evidence that suggests that Muslim organizations, particularly those with some form of Muslim or Islam in their title, are experiencing significant impact of counterterrorism law in the in their financial activities. So what I mean by that is, let's say you're called Islam for Peace. You are based in the UK and you have operations, let's say, in five high-risk field environments. You are receiving donations in the UK, let's say from the government, population, and other places around the world, and then you are sending pockets of money to Somalia, Gaza, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, I, let's say Philippines. You need to use wire transfers and banks in order to facilitate that sending those funds, right? You're not sending money to people, but you're sending money to your maybe your own branch organizations who will then pay salaries and fees and everything else. We've seen uh, quite a bit of evidence that those transactions are either being blocked or slowed down. So banks are, of course, subject to all the counterterrorism laws that I talked about. And banks are very, very concerned about their risk exposure here. There were banks that were found to have facilitated Al-Qaeda transactions, unknowingly perhaps, but they didn't have the right systems in place. Right? So. Islam for Peace suddenly finds itself either denied the transaction, so the bank says, sorry, you can't wire that money to Somalia. It's flagged off three of our most high-risk you know, indicators. Or they'll allow the wire transfer, but then it'll get stopped at some other bank in the process, sent back. There are fees, of course, being activated at all points where this is happening. Um, and more and more Muslim organizations, humanitarian organizations, find themselves having to have all kinds of exceptionally complex transactions just to get money from point A to point B. So that's one. And that's serious, right? If you're talking about 3 4% coming off the top of your funding, that's not a minimal uh, expense. That's not – we're seeing that Muslim organizations may simply be denied banking services altogether. So you may have banks, they're not just saying we won't wire the money to Somalia, you can't work with us. You, you can't, we will not have an account for you. They're entirely, you have no right to a banking service, right? It's not a human rights issue. They are a private entity that is allowed to say no. Uh, and those of you in the UK or who are watching this may have seen there was a big discussion uh, with Barclays bank over the question of, of remittances to Somalia and the and the facilitation of wire transfers there. Um, third, if we look at the prosecution records in the United States, it is certainly clear that the material support statute in the United States has been used by a huge majority uh, against Muslim individuals and Muslim organizations. Now, let me put a huge, big caveat on that. These are not international humanitarian organizations. These are largely individuals and groups that did appear on the facts to actually want to provide support to Al-Qaeda or affiliated organizations, with one really important exception. Uh, the Holy Land Foundation, which was the largest Muslim charity organization in the United States, huge charity organization in the United States, was indeed, uh, its, its five senior staff were prosecuted for violation of the criminal material support statute uh, on, the, on the argument that 
their uh, funds and support to a number of zakat committees had ultimately provided uh, financial support to Hamas. They were convicted. They are all in prison. Um, and for many Muslims, and I think for many Muslim organizations, the specter of the Holy Land Foundation prosecution looms large. Uh, and they see that as indicating that it is deeply problematic when humanitarians say no one has ever been prosecuted um, and then take umbrage uh, at, at that suggestion because they say, well, actually, there was a very serious prosecution. Um, so is it discriminatory? I don't think we have evidence of that yet. Is it having a far more significant impact in a practical sense, in a day-to-day -day sense, on Muslim organizations, I think without a doubt the answer to that is yes. Uh, hello, thanks, Naz. Um, a question from Barry Stein of CARE. Uh, with the partner vetting system and the amount of information that's being required to be provided to the US government, is this contravening European data protection laws? I am so glad you asked that question. The short answer to that, and I, and I really like it when I can say something extremely clear, is yes. Uh, so it seems pretty clear that EU data protection in particular prohibits the provision of personal information required by USAID and the State Department in the way it is currently required being provided in the way it is currently be, being provided. So currently, both USAID and state uh, have a um, online portal through which this is being supposed to be provided. And you are being asked to provide, I think what most of us would consider to be pretty personal information, passport number, national ID number, name in the case of Afghanistan and, and Palestine, name of father, name of grandfather, home address, email address, mobile phone number. It's a pretty, um, it's information that I think most people would see as, as being quite, uh, that they have a privacy interest in it. And certainly the EU thinks you have a privacy interest in it. So we have a paper on our website um, at the bottom there. For those of you that are interested in this, where a, a number of lawyers who are experts in the EU uh, data protection and privacy laws looked closely at uh, PVS and RAM, which is the equivalent State Department program, and their conclusion is it's a conflict. And their conclusion is that organizations based in Europe or subject to European data protection would be facing a very serious legal question should they comply with the US legal requirements. And as of yet, to our knowledge, the United States government has not created any kind of uh, exception or effort to assist organizations who are subject to EU um, data protection. And I should say here, as much as I said that the U.S. counterterrorism law appears to be very much the kind of globalizing model for other states, EU data protection law is the model for data protection around the world. It is very much the approach that appears to be being adopted by uh, the global south and by, and by other countries outside of the European framework. So this, I think, this tension is not just serious, it's going to become more serious. And it's a real question for humanitarian organizations whether they press on this or not, whether they insist that they simply cannot comply with this requirement because of their um, EU data protection obligations, it's it's yet to be seen. Um, I think the U.S. government's view is that the tension is absolutely not as uh, clear or as important as, as I've just suggested, and that indeed European organizations can and should uh, comply with the requirement. And, and of course, the other uh, position of the U.S. government is you don't have to take U.S. government money. Uh, if you think there's a legal conflict, then don't take our funding. Thanks, Nez. Um, just a last question from me. I think a lot of our members find this whole topic mm. quite daunting, mm. um, and particularly from the security perspective, and what impact are these having at program level in the field? Are we still able to work mm. safely? What are the 
um, consequences for our staff trying to operate, um, both the internationals and the national staff. What do you advise us to do? What are some simple steps that we can start doing at program level, at field level, to make sure that we are not going to be prosecuted under these laws? Or in fact, should we be um, gathering information so that we can counter these laws to work on, particularly with the US uh, at the moment, looking at, at more exemptions? Should we be doing more to, to try and support some of that within EU legislation areas? Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> We're in the privileged position of being able to say that we do research and don't provide advice. So I certainly wouldn't um, claim to be providing any advice to anyone, and certainly not legal advice, but I can provide some reflections based on uh, our work and our work with humanitarian actors and donors. Um, one is, yes, this is daunting, I think, for everyone. I think it's daunting for governments as well. I think that donor governments find themselves uh, wanting to do the right thing, wanting to be helpful, um, wanting to facilitate rapid provision of assistance, but also stuck in a real dilemma that uh, most governments consider it legitimate to have laws in place that limit the provision of their taxpayer funds to individuals and groups that they have decided are unlawful. Um, and I think most of us would agree that governments ha have the right to do that and indeed should do it. It's how that I think becomes the issue. Um, in terms of simple steps, a few thoughts uh, of what I've seen that I think is, is effective. One is figure out within your organization who is touched by these issues and how can you have a dialogue internally on these issues. So who gets your contracts? Who looks at whether your contracts have counterterrorism clauses in them? Who decides whether or not a particular counterterrorism clause is problematic in a particular field context? Um, and then who's expected to comply with that? Who's being asked to audit against that? Who's being asked to uh, ensure that there are anti-diversion policies in place. If there is no answer to that question, you may want to try to facilitate getting an answer to that question. Um, some organizations have a working group internally that looks at these issues. Some organizations have a very clear anti-diversion checklist, and there are people that are responsible for aspects of that checklist. So have a look at your organization's profile. Who are you getting funding from? Where are you incorporated? Where do you have tax-free, tax-exempt status? Where is your staff from? Uh, look at the main areas where you may be touched by these laws and then think about what are the areas where you really want to go a step further. So if you're a U.S. organization with U.S. funding, that's going to have a certain set of implications for where you should look. If you have five or six government donors and offices all around the world, again, significant, potentially significant amount of uh, provisions you're at least going to want to get a first look at. And, and this doesn't require a full-time lawyer necessarily. It may just be that someone is kind of gathering up all of the different clauses in the key um, legal regimes that affect so that's a first simple step. Uh, a second simple step may be, and, and certainly in our research we've seen this, um, working either through some kind of NGO coalition at the field level or at headquarters, um, work with other organizations to find out sort of at the collective level what's being asked of organizations and what are organizations doing in response. This is a very difficult topic to deal with in a vacuum. In fact, I'd go further and say it's problematic to deal with it in a vacuum. You want to know what are organizations that are similarly situated to you doing and what are they being asked to do. Now, some have suggested that this implies that in the future we may want to have some kind of sector-wide guidelines or sector-wide uh, approaches to this. 
I certainly don't have an opinion on that myself. I'm not a humanitarian actor and I don't work for an operational humanitarian organization, but um, there may be a lot to be said for that approach. Um, so I think that's another sort of area to start thinking about is if what do what might it look like if we were to identify sort of shared standards and approaches. Um, third, I think, and this is a tough one, and I think it's a tough one for a lot of humanitarian organizations to talk about, within your own organization, what is the distribution of responsibility between the field and headquarters on this, and what do you think should be the distribution of responsibility between field and headquarters? So one thing we found in our research on counterterrorism clauses in grants is that there are some organizations that are so decentralized that someone at the field level may be authorized to negotiate a contract, review a contract, sign a contract, and begin implementation of a project with little to no involvement from headquarters. If that is the case, and if your organization is operating in four country environments where donors are imposing different counterterrorism clauses, your organization now may have 8, 10, 15 different contracts with different counterterrorism obligations, and you all don't know that about each other, and headquarters doesn't know that. So I'm not at all suggesting that there is a right answer. Either it should be all headquarters run or it should be all field run. But I'm suggesting that um, one step that may be really important to take as you think about this is, is this an area where organizations need to really identify what are we entrusting our field people to do alone? What are we asking our field people to report on back to headquarters, understanding that that exposes them to risk? And what is headquarters doing to ensure staff that they are protected, that they are safe, that they are doing their jobs without having to worry that they are exposed to individual legal liability. Um, and that's a step that I think many, many organizations have not yet taken. Um, and it, it can be intimidating to do that because it means that you may have to think about legal liability or risk in a way that seems absurd. How could you be prosecuted for doing humanitarian work? But the reality is that this is what it is. You're not likely to be prosecuted. You're likely to be affected by this. Um, and, and that may create an incentive to start to come up with approaches and policies both within your organization and across, again, similarly situated organizations. Sorry, oh, yeah, and let sorry. me say and a, let me word, say a about, word about um, um, the Interagency Standing Committee Task Team on Humanitarian Space and Sustainable Access and Risk Management, um, which is a quite a long title, but a very important body made up of a number of humanitarian NGOs and, and UN agencies, co-chaired at the moment by NRC and OCHA. Um, has undertaken a process to develop a toolkit on this issue. Uh, particularly what we found, um, we did some work with the task team starting about a year and a half ago, and, and what we found in our research and our consultations is that it's this contract issue that most organizations are, are feeling the impact from. So, so let me be very clear about that. The prosecution issue is a criminal law issue. That some organizations take really seriously. Other organizations have just decided we don't think we're that exposed, and so we're not going to spend a lot of time thinking about it. The contract issue is very different. That is, your organization has signed or has been asked to sign a binding legal document that includes counterterrorism obligations in it. The task team, I think, has recognized that's a really salient issue for its members and for the humanitarian community at large. And a corollary to that is what are organizations doing to comply with those contractual obligations and what ought they do to comply? Um, so their goal is to develop in quite a, a short time frame, I think, given the demand and the need, a toolkit for humanitarian actors on this issue. So what do you need to know about contracts? How should you approach contracts on this issue? And then 
ostensibly what should organizations do in order to limit their risk exposure and ensure that they're doing the right thing, right? both in terms of humanitarian principles, but also in terms of avoiding diversion to armed groups and to listed actors. Um, and I think there is a lot of room for input. So if your organization is thinking about this, or if you have observed um, areas where you think it would be really helpful to have this guidance, it would be really helpful when we are in a cluster meeting to know that sort of this is the baseline approach we're taking. Whatever it is that, that you think would be useful in your own context, my sense is that the task team is, is and I say this as someone who is not on the task team, but my sense in engaging with the task team for, for over a year now is that it's very open to input and that you're in a position to really be able to shape this toolkit. Um, so I definitely would urge you to, um, through EISF um, and, and through your organizations, to think about what would be helpful, what kind of document, what kind of tools would be constructive and take us out of this kind of daunting, overwhelming uh, amount of information and move us to real practical tools and approaches. Okay, thank you so much for that, Naz. Um, to reinforce what she said, EISF is on the um, IASC task force or task team, um, and so any input you have to the toolkit, I'll be sharing what I can in terms of terms of reference. So if anybody has any ideas or suggestions, feedback, um, it would be much appreciated. Further to that, uh, EISF will continue to engage on this topic. If any of you have any more questions or any suggestions on areas where EISF can further support you in moving this process forward, do please get in touch. Um, so just finally, I'd like to say thank you very much to Naz for her time and for joining us here in Waterloo this morning for Leah from ALNAP for helping us and for Ruth, as always, for doing all of the organization. Thank you very much for joining us this morning.